Portions of AquaKids have been produced with the cooperation of the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. As our Great Lake adventure continues, we're going to be working with the University of Minnesota Duluth, who will be taking a general fish survey in this estuary. Hey Josh, how are you? Good. Nice to meet you. So explain to us, what are we going to be doing today? We're going to take some of these nets here and mm -hmm. set them in the vegetation. Now these nets set out overnight and any fish that are swimming in the area will get guided into some funnels and get trapped and held there until we come back the next morning and empty the net. What is the purpose of this? This is so that we can compare different areas in the estuary to see the numbers of fish, the types of fish, the proportion of invasive species in different areas. So I see that you have two different nets here. What is that purpose? Well, the main difference is that we've got different mesh size. These are 3 8 inch meth mesh. These are uh, 3 quarter inch mesh. You get some of the smaller fish in the finer mesh, but there may be some fish avoidance with some of the bigger ones uh, in the smaller mesh size. And the frame height is different. These are much uh, shorter. They're half a meter high. These are one meter high. So we set the bigger ones in deeper water and we set the smaller ones in shallower water. Okay. Is it safe for the fish? Yes, we take the um, cod end and we tie it up so that the fish are safe inside, but any, also any turtles or muskrats or semi-aquatic bycatch have a space in there to breathe. So it's safe for the fish and anything else that isn't a fish. What creatures do you hope to find? Well, we're probably going to get a ver variety of fish species, uh, all large and small fish, some minnows, some suckers, and some large predators like northern pike. And we'll probably get some uh, turtles also. Well, how about we help? There. Okay, so start walking straight and I'll follow you with a steak and a hammer. Steak and a hammer? I didn't know we were having dinner. Okay, keep going in. Okay, why don't you take the steak okay. and I'll get the bottom lead line out here and put the bottom right through there. Now this is what we end up driving in. And I'll get it started here. Doesn't take very much. Okay, why don't you put the stake right about here and then we'll pound it in and that'll give us a little bit more room to tighten it up. Come on guys, we don't have all day. And now you can take that yellow line that you're holding and tie it off on the stake. Okay, looks like we're all done with this net. Now we can go set another one. All right, cool. All right. Okay, this looks like a great spot for a net right here. What's with all the bugs flying around? These are mayflies, and in the estuary, they're really the main food source at the bottom of the food chain. They live for a long time in the mud, and a lot of insects, will, or a lot of fish will eat them uh, as they're invertebrates and when they turn into winged adults and fly around. Oh, wow. Huh. Mm -hmm. There's okay. one right there. Yep, there's no, a lot like... of them. Okay, so just keep feeding that cork line out and backing up. Okay, and once you go right in there into those cattails. Okay, now you'll tie it off on that stake. All right. Okay, you can take that net and just start backing it up until these frames lift up and it straightens out. Okay. It's like right about there. Okay, we'll tie it off down here. Okay. That's it for the lead and the cut end. And you'll tie it right here on that yellow line. All right, guys, you gotta get this pole in, but I got a feeling you're up to something. Hammer in the marks, don't hit it too harsh, gotta drive it in and catch a fish with a fin. <laughs> okay, well, that was pretty good. Well, Josh, we're coming back here tomorrow to see what we caught, right? That's right. All right. Hammer in the marsh, don't hit it too harsh, gotta drive it in and catch a fish with a fin. And we'll be right back. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's time to test your knowledge with another aqua quiz. Fishing is a favorite pastime on the Great Lakes, which comprise one of the largest freshwater fisheries in the world. 
Some of the most common catches include trout, salmon, walleye, perch, herring, and bass. Lake sturgeon are the biggest species of fish found in the lakes. Do you know the record weight of a sturgeon caught in the Great Lakes region? Is it A, 175 pounds, B, 190 pounds, C, 209 pounds, or D, 240 pounds? I'll have the answer after the break. Welcome back. Do you know the weight of the largest sturgeon ever caught in the Great Lakes region? The answer is D, 240 pounds. In 2012, the largest sturgeon ever caught on Lake Winnebago was 125 years old, weighed 240 pounds, and measured 87.5 inches in length. It was tagged and released by scientists from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We'll see you next week with another Aqua Quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. As our Great Lake adventure continues, we're here now on Kelly Bay. We're about to travel to Cliff Island wetlands to sample vertebrates and invertebrates to check the condition of the estuary. Let's get started. We've now arrived at Clough Island, where yesterday we set these traps with Josh. Josh, did we catch anything? We'll find out. All right, what do we have to do? First thing we do is take a look around the net and see if there's any holes from muskrats. Okay. Um, so we just take a look. I don't see any. It looks like nothing. we're okay. All right. No holes. Okay, uh, why don't you go over there, Selena, and hold that knot where the cod end is tied, mm -hmm. and we'll work on getting the frame loose. <gasps> We can't take him anywhere. And then now we finish shaking him down into this net or into this cooler. All right, looks like all the fish are out. All right. So what do we have? Well, this one here is a rock bass. All right, so this rock bass uh, is a species that lives in the vegetated areas of wetlands. They eat little minnows, little fish that are uh, young of the year, and a lot of invertebrates. What family are they in? These are, it's a centrarchid, so it's in the same family as sunfishes and bass. All right, so I'm gonna put this one back. Uh, actually, you can do it if you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're gonna free Willie. <laughs> All right. You're free. What else do we have? Well, this one is a pumpkin seed sunfish, and it's another one of the very common species in wetlands. It has beautiful coloration there. Yeah, they're very colorful. And the trademark uh, identifying feature is that orange-red spot on the back of their percular flap. I get to let this one go. <laughs> All right. Bye. What do we have next? So this bluegill is another real common fish in wetlands, very similar to pumpkin seed. The distinguishing trait on these is just a dark opercular flap and a dark blotch down at the end of their soft dorsal fin. So is this a typical catch of what you guys get here? Yeah, in the small nets we get a lot of the smaller fish because the funnel size restricts the body size of the fish that can get into it. What else do we have, Josh? Well, here we have a small largemouth bass. Wow. Is the largemouth bass one of the main predators in this area? In wetland areas that have a lot of vegetation, they are very dominant predators. And with this net being set in a sandy area, I'm not surprised to see them. Largemouth bass would have spawned in this area. Okay, here's another one that's new. We haven't seen this one yet. And this one is a yellow perch. When they're small like this, they are very important food sources for the walleye, the northerns, and the muskies in this river. Mm -hmm. And when they get larger, they become predators themselves. They'll get large enough to eat small fish. This isn't in the same family as the sunfish, is it? No, this is in a different family, Persidae, the same family as walleye. Okay, and we also got a young northern pike. And they spawn in, uh, the adults spawn in vegetation like this. So you expect to see some of the young of the year here. So this is a good sign. So what's the main diet of this pike? This small one like this will be eating little invertebrates and also newly emerged fish that, from other species. Do you normally find invasives as well? We typically do in the St. Louis River. In uh, this net we didn't so far, but we did catch a crayfish and we always check to see if it's a rusty crayfish or not. Rusty crayfish are the invasives. And you can check just by looking right here and seeing if there's a rusty orange spot. And this one doesn't have that. So this is one of our native species. 
What is that? So this is a water scorpion. It will also get in our nets uh, because they take this, uh, what looks like a spine, but it's actually like a snorkel. And they hang upside down and they use these little claws that are kind of like long praying mantis claws. Mm -hmm. And they hang in the water and they grab food that comes by, little bugs and uh, zooplankton. Wow. So they drift around in the water column and we'll get them in our nets also. That is a strange fish. What do we have here? So this is one of the invasive species in the St. Louis River. This is a tube-nosed goby. And this species has a fused pelvic fin down at the bottom, like a round-nosed goby that it's related to. And they sit on the bottom, and one of the um, questions that we have here is, how much do they interrupt the food web of other native fish that also live on the bottom, like log perch and Johnny darters? Well, Josh, we've seen a lot so far, but we still have one more net so we have to go check out. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll be right back. For more information on today's show, go to aquakidstv.org. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're back at Cuff Island and we're about ready to check our second net. So, Josh, what do you think is in there? Well, we'll find out. You never quite know. Okay, I'm excited. Let's go. All right. So, same as the last net, we'll check the net for holes. All right and we gotta secure the cod end to make sure that doesn't open up when we start pulling the net. Nope, I don't see any. Okay. No holes here. All right, now we'll just take the frame and we'll tilt it so we get the bottom up. Like that. And now we got all the fish stuck in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we're just gonna move down a little bit. Okay. We'll get the edge of the frame on the boat. They'll take some of the weight off. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll pick the frames up, and that'll get a lot of height. Okay. And it'll help get these shaped. There you go. Thank you. That is a huge oh. bass. Oh, yeah, look at nice it. Oh, nice one. Oh, and a turtle. Oh, yeah, and there's wow. some turtles in this one. Too. Goodness. Wow. That thing is huge. <laughs> so we did catch one very nice Ooh. smallmouth bass. This is a real big one. Wow. So, how do you tell it's a small mouth and not a large mouth, besides the mouth? <laughs> well, besides, the mouth is really on adults, it's key. The closed mouth doesn't go past the eye. Okay. And a large mouth, it will. So these are one of the, you know, big predators in the wetland here. So we're going to put this one back. Okay. Bye, little buddy. There he goes. Even though you're not yeah, little. Yeah, that's a little right buddy. <laughs> okay, we got a couple other nice fish in here. This is a really nice bluegill. So this is a big one. This is what people are out here fishing for in the winter time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to go. There yeah. Goes. Yep. What else do we have? We can get, I see a larger uh, black crappie. So I'll see if I can get you a good look at that one. Okay. All right, so this one we didn't have, this is a species we didn't have in one of our uh, small nets. This is a black crappie. And like the yellow perch, these start off when they're small, eating invertebrates and very, very small fish. But when they get larger, they'll get much larger than this. They'll be able to eat mostly fish. Small minnows uh, become primarily their diet. So he's in the same family as the sunfish and bluegill? Yes, that's right. So what do we have? Now it looks like we're down to the turtles. Oh, cool. Here's a painted turtle. It's gorgeous. And one of the things that we keep track of, because we'll commonly get them in our nets, is we'll take a plastron length, which is the length of their shell under their belly here. What's the noise it's making? They make a little hissing sound. It's a sound that they want to be left alone. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll put them back. So do those turtles live in and out of the water? Yeah, they'll crawl up onto logs and right near the shore. They prefer being in the water, but they uh, are the reason why we tie the cod end up in our net. So if the turtles get in, they can keep coming up to the surface and breathe air. What types of turtles do you typically find out here? We'll get lots of painted turtles and also common snapping turtles. Okay. Well, we found some great creatures out here. And we'll be right back with more on our Great Lakes adventure. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. We know that we fundamentally need to change course as a society. Youth leadership and the creativity of the next generation is extremely important to be fostering, to find their passions and work towards creating sustainable solutions to complex problems. 
My name is Alex Fried and I'm the founder and director of PLAN, the Post Landfill Action Network, and we're based out of Durham, New Hampshire. Our goal is to build student leadership around waste reduction initiatives, help campuses move in the direction of zero waste. I've been involved in waste reduction programs and initiatives since high school. At the end of my first year at UNH, we noticed a huge problem, which was that dumpsters were overflowing with usable materials when students move out at the end of the year. We have 12,000 students at UNH. Uh, on an average month, we throw away about 25 tons of trash. In the month of May, we threw away 105 tons. And so what that looked like was not just normal dumpsters on campus, but around 20 extra dumpsters overflowing with couches and electronics and dorm refrigerators and dishware and clothing and all usable materials that were being sent to a landfill every single year. So we started organizing students and we created a program called Trash to Treasure. And so what we do is at the end of the year when students move out, we collect all the stuff that they would have otherwise thrown away. We set up drop-off locations and we try to make it as easy for students as humanly possible to participate in the program. We also put out um, information for students to contact us so that we can come do off-campus collections. So we'll drive a truck over to an apartment and collect stuff from their apartment directly. We store it all over the summer and then we hold a big sale during moving weekend and we sell everything back to students at discount prices. I can those next. We try to frame the event as a very like welcome to college experience. So it's an opportunity for students to understand what sustainability efforts happen on campus. We have local student organizations and local nonprofits tabling at the event. Um, the revenue from the yard sale then creates a self-sustaining fund for future waste reduction initiatives on campus. And in the last three years, we've diverted over 110 tons of usable materials from the landfill. We've also recycled over 2,000 electronics, donated five tons of food and clothing to local shelters, We've generated around $55,000 in revenue for future sustainable programs on campus. We've saved the University of New Hampshire $10,000 in disposal fees. We've saved parents and students around $216,000. My energy and my passion behind this comes from the knowledge that we are operating in completely unsustainable ways. We have a waste problem in our society and a resource problem in our society. We know that we are currently utilizing resources such that we would need one and a half planets to sustain the rate of growth that we are currently operating at. When the only solution is a dumpster, everything looks like trash. So the long-term vision of the Post Landfill Action Network is hundreds of campus communities working together to solve waste, sharing resources and best practices to help them build post landfill campuses. When you give them the tools and resources to find the solutions themselves, that's where change is really made. Wasn't that great? Now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it. You could be our next Eco Defender. See you soon. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Oh, hey, the kids are over there. Yeah, but we better tell them what we're doing. We're here at Lester Park, and we're going to teach kids how to fish. It helps keep them involved with the environment. Let's go check it out. All right. Hey, guys. How are you today? Good! Are you excited? Yeah! I don't, I don't really think I don't they're excited. Know. Are you guys excited? Yeah! yeah now, now you are. <laughs> Glad you guys could join us today. Today we're working with some kids from Leicester Park area. We're going to be taking them fishing. But as I, as I was telling them earlier, to go fishing you don't need a lot of gear. You don't have to pay a bunch of money. In fact, all you need is a pop can. But first, the most important part of any fishing pole is the knot. So we've got a little practice activity here. This will be our hook with its eye, and then this will be our fishing line. You need some help? Yeah. Okay, so take these two lines and hold them tight, and twist your dowel, which would be your hook when you're fishing. Twist it five or six times. Take your hand, go one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so which one do this loop right?